Spanish war dogs. During the Spanish invasion of the Americas, they used an army of cruel and bloodthirsty animals to decimate the indigenous people they came into contact with. The Spanish had war dogs, massive beasts fully clad in armor with mouths of bloody fangs. Some Spanish war dogs were so brutally effective at killing that they allegedly earned salaries just like normal Spanish soldiers. The Native Americans had dogs too, but they weren't exactly predators. They were small, hairless, and most of them didn't weigh more than 60 pounds. They were big enough dogs and loyal pets, but nothing compared to the war dogs the Spaniards brought. The Spanish war dogs were bred to be killers. More than that, they were trained to recognize the difference between the Spanish and the indigenous people. They were used to guard camps, and they were unleashed in battle, and they were also brought along on hunts. The exact breed of the war dogs was Mastiff. Spanish Mastiffs could weigh up to 250 pounds. Their jaws were so strong, they could crush a human skull between their teeth. The dogs aided in the Spaniards' reign of brutality. Many native tribes were terrified of the dogs, even more so than the Spanish, so they would simply accept subjugation. It was better to bend the knee to the Spanish than risk one of the monstrous hounds ripping them apart. But how did the Spanish keep their dogs so hungry for human flesh? You likely know even without me needing to tell you. Spanish war dogs were fed a constant supply of human meat. They were allowed to eat the bodies of the dead, and in the days before battle they would be starved so they were even more ferocious. Of course, Spanish warhounds didn't go into battle unprotected. They were fitted with padded jackets, spiked collars, and sometimes suits of armor. Historians say Christopher Columbus may have been the first Spaniard to unleash the hellish beasts on natives during his second voyage to America, between 1493 and 1496. When Columbus returned, he brought guns, swords, and fearsome dogs. When he attacked the natives of Hispaniola in 1493, Christopher Columbus did so with his packs of war dogs, and he did the same with the natives of Jamaica in 1494. When Columbus fought the Battle of Vega Real in 1495, he had 200 men, 20 horses, and 20 mastiffs. But even with such small numbers, they easily devastated the 10,000 native Arawak. After Christopher Columbus, word got out that Spanish war dogs could be used as an unstoppable weapon, so other Spaniards began to fit them with armor and train them to kill. Discovering the Amazon Francisco de Oriana was the Spanish conquistador who first explored the Amazon River. He embarked upon an expedition in 1541 with Gonzalo Pizarro. They weren't looking for the greatest river in the world, but for the city of El Dorado. The Spaniards believed the great city of gold was hiding somewhere in the deep and unexplored jungle, and they would stop at nothing to find it. But the expedition was a total disaster. Francisco and Gonzalo came under siege by legions of hungry insects. They encountered hostile natives, then ran out of food before getting separated from one another. Gonzalo sent Francisco to scout ahead with 50 men, but he ended up traveling down the Amazon River all the way to the Atlantic Ocean, making him the first European to travel the length of it. The trip hadn't necessarily been on purpose. After the two conquistadors separated, Francisco wanted to return, but his men refused. They didn't want to paddle back upriver and threaten to mutiny, so they had no choice but to go on, traveling from Quito by river all the way to Venezuela. During their journey, they were attacked by indigenous groups. Many of the men suffered from malnutrition, and people also caught malaria and died, and by the time Francisco finally found himself a way out of the wilderness, his troops were decimated. He then returned to Spain with a great story to tell in 1543. He understood the vastness of the Amazon region and had seen enough people to know it was populated. He believed the jungle was home to the legendary kingdom of the Amazons from Spanish myth. He was then given governorship of the entire Amazon River region and went back in 1545 to claim it. Francisco reached the mouth of the Amazon in December of that year, only to be abandoned by his crew. And as Francisco and the few men who hadn't ditched him explored the jungle, they were attacked by natives. Then, on an unknown day in 1546, Francisco Oriana died thinking he was about to conquer the greatest jungle on Earth with half a dozen Spaniards. 
the lost treasure of Lima. The colonization of Peru was a long and bloody affair. Throughout the centuries it took for Spain to conquer the land, they accumulated an insane amount of wealth. The Spanish robbed every native group they could find and sent most of the treasure back to the king in Spain. But they didn't send everything back. In the city of Lima, over the course of many hundreds of years, a treasure was slowly accumulating. Gold, jewels, and religious artifacts were being stockpiled in Lima. Then, in 1820, things started to fall apart for the Spanish. Peru declared itself independent, and the new leaders felt they needed to relocate the treasure to Mexico, where it would be safe. The Peruvians reached out to famous merchant Captain William Thompson. They thought they could trust him to transport the goods safely to Mexico, but William had other plans with the roughly $1 billion of treasure in his cargo hold. And once William was on the open ocean, he and his crew murdered the Peruvian guards and charted a new course. He traveled to Cocos Island off the coast of Costa Rica, and there on the island, William and his crew buried the treasure. But the thieves were soon captured by a Navy ship. William agreed to take the authorities to the treasure in exchange for not being hanged. However, this turned out to be a ruse. William slipped away and was never seen again. And to this day, the treasure has never been found. Treasure hunters have been pouring over Cocos Island for two centuries trying to locate it, but nobody has had any luck. It's been so long now that historians are starting to wonder if the treasure was ever real to begin with. The Assassination of Pizarro Francisco Pizarro was the illegitimate son of a wealthy Spaniard. He was part of the crew who sailed to Colombia in 1510 under the leadership of Alonso de Ojeda. Everyone on board the ship had heard about an impressive wealth hidden somewhere in the land of the Inca. They went on several more voyages, securing their funding from Emperor Charles V, and they ultimately landed in Tumbes in 1532. Francisco Pizarro marched on the city of Cajamarca and met with Inca Emperor Atahualpa. He then convinced Atahualpa to offer a king's ransom worth of gold, and after winning the trust of the Inca, Pizarro betrayed them. He murdered the emperor and immediately began his conquest of the entire country. And in 1533, Francisco Pizarro defeated the Inca resistance at Cuzco. It was at this time that the age of the Inca had come to a gruesome and humiliating end. With the Inca largely in control, Pizarro was named governor of Peru. He then founded the city of Lima, and that was when the politics started to mess everything up. One of Pizarro's closest allies was conquistador Diego de Almagro. He sent Diego to conquer Chile, but didn't offer the man a very good reward. So bad blood brewed between them, and Diego de Almagro attacked the city of Cuzco in 1538. But Francisco quickly snuffed the rebellion out, and Almagro was put to death. But that was just the start. Almagro left behind an adult son, and his son wasn't very happy about his father's assassination. Three years later, on June 26, 1541, Almagro's angry supporters attacked Pizarro's palace while he was eating dinner. The governor of Peru was then assassinated at his table, and afterward, Diego de Almagro's son, also named Diego, proclaimed himself the undisputed governor of Peru. Francisco Pizarro committed genocide against an entire people, conquered the ancient lands of the Andes, and then was murdered by his own men. This is an excellent example of how colonial rule in Peru became nothing but a brutal power struggle between various conquistadors. The Toxcatl Massacre on May 22, 1520, the Spanish attacked the city of Tenochtitlan. The city was home to the Mexicas, an ancient group who lived in Mexico and spoke the Nahual language. You likely know them better as the Aztec, which is what most historians refer to them as today. But they were really the Mexica. So, why do you think it's called Mexico and not Azteco? The Mexica had dominated a huge amount of territory along the Gulf Coast all the way to Guatemala, and Tenochtitlan was their great and shining capital. The attack took place during the Toxcatl Festival, a religious event dedicated to the god Texcatlipoca. Every year the event unfolded in the capital, ending with the ritual sacrifice of a young man. During the year prior, the young man pretended to be an impersonator of the god, so on the festival day he was brutally slaughtered. The Spaniards hadn't chosen the date to attack by accident. Everyone was busy with the festival, and it 
it was easy for Herman Cortes to take the city by force. For the past 500 years, the accepted history has been what was written by the Spaniards, like what Francisco Lopez de Gamara recorded in his History of Mexico. The Spaniards justified their attack by claiming the indigenous celebration was a ruse to disguise a rebellion. However, texts written by the Mexica paint a much different picture. Nahuatl texts claim it was a treachery by the Spanish. They steamrolled the city, committed a massacre, and then celebrated on the bones of the dead. From the native accounts, historians are finally starting to understand just how brutal the Tox cattle massacre was. The Spanish had already executed Emperor Montezuma and raided the palace of its gold. But that wasn't enough. So they rampaged through the city streets, hacking apart defenseless and unarmed Mexicas. The massacre reached fever pitch at Templo Maya, the main ceremonial temple in the city. People who'd come out for the festival were slaughtered as they desperately tried to escape. The Mexica did mount a counterattack and won the battle, but it was the start of a war they had no hope of winning. The Spanish Inquisition the Inquisition originated in France when Pope Lucius III sent bishops to track down the Catharists in 1184 AD. The official Spanish Inquisition began in 1482 with Inquisitor General Tomás de Torquemada. This was the era of torture and pain to elicit confessions from those that were deemed heretics. People were burned at the stake, and it was utterly horrendous. But the Spanish Inquisition continued until the Inquisitor General became a little too comfortable in his position. When he started investigating members of the clergy, Pope Alexander VI shut it down. But the Inquisition couldn't be stopped. The Roman Inquisition started in 1542 and spilled over into the New World. Spain brought the Inquisition with them into the Americas, and it was established in Mexico in 1570. Spanish Inquisitors tracked down Lutherans and burned them at the stake as heretics, and shortly afterward, the Inquisition arrived in Peru, where Protestants were tortured and burned. Everyone outside the Catholic Church was deemed a heretic and a potential victim for brutality. Then in 1580, the Inquisition really heated up. Spain began to slaughter Jews. There was a mass extermination event in which Spain tried to rid Western Europe of the Jewish people. King Philip II also renewed hostilities against the Moorish people. An estimated 150,000 Muslims were forced out of Spain, and anyone who was Protestant, Muslim, Jewish, or Lutheran had to flee Spanish territory. That included everywhere Spain had dominated in the Americas. It was one of the reasons so many Protestants ended up in the US, one of the few places they could practice in peace away from the Spanish. What do you think the Americas would look like today if the Spanish didn't obliterate the ancient people and history on the continent? Let us know in the comments, and if you haven't already, subscribe! The Fountain of Youth Juan Ponce de Leon was the governor of Hispaniola when he ventured out to explore a nearby island in the early 16th century. And today, that island is called Puerto Rico. Juan's interest in the island was pure fantasy. He'd heard rumors about gold deposits on the island. So he took 50 soldiers in a single boat, founded the small settlement of Capara, and proclaimed himself governor. He never found any gold, but he did hear about another rumor. Juan was told that somewhere on an island called Bamini was the Fountain of Youth. The Fountain of Youth had magical healing waters that would make Juan an immortal, or at least something close to an immortal. He believed it was on an island somewhere between Florida and the Caribbean. And when he didn't find the fountain in Puerto Rico, he began scouring the Florida coastline in 1513. The first place Juan and his crew landed was near modern-day St. Augustine. He'd already been displaced as the governor of Puerto Rico by Christopher Columbus's son Diego, but he had more important problems. He needed to claim more land for the Spanish crown and uncover the secrets of the Fountain of Youth. So he explored the Florida Keys, found the Gulf Stream, and went back to Spain. He was named military governor of Florida and was ordered to colonize it. He was also ordered to secure Puerto Rico because of an uprising that had taken place while he was gone. On his next journey, Ponce de Leon established a farming colony in Florida near Charlotte Harbor. But what happened next, nobody really knows. Juan was desperate to find the Fountain of Youth as he grew older. He searched high and low and scoured every island, but found no trace of it. Then, in 1521, the colony near Charlotte Harbor was decimated by natives. Juan was wounded during the attack and died from his injuries after retreating to Havana, Cuba. The Destruction of the Codices 
Europeans in the New World didn't simply kill people, spread disease and pillage. They also destroyed the culture of those they came into contact with. The Spanish were particularly cruel when it came to erasing heritage. The best example of this is the burning of ancient manuscripts known as the Mexican Codices. There are only about two dozen codices that survived the mass book burning performed by the Spanish. But hundreds more did exist, detailing the cultural legends, history, religion, and life in Mexico for centuries. According to the University of Arizona Library, even some of the early Mexican rulers helped destroy manuscripts to obliterate the past. The collection of codices was written by a variety of people who lived in Mexico through the centuries. Most were written by the Mixtec, but the Mexica and Maya made some as well. They were written starting in 629 AD, with the newest being from 1642. There are only four Mayan codices left today, and most of them were written during the Spanish invasion. The codices weren't written on sheets of paper, but rather on scraps of deer hide and cotton cloth. They also sometimes used bark paper. The Mixtec of Oaxaca created pictographic books. They detailed their history in vividly colored law books. Wars, important births, deaths of emperors, and everything along those lines were logged in the codices in the form of pictures. They didn't show much about everyday life, but instead focused on feasts and conquests. The Maya books are very similar. The only ones that are still around don't discuss history, though. There are only four books and they contain information on astronomy and rituals. The rest of the Maya codices were burned by Franciscan missionaries. As for the Mexica Aztec codices, there's nothing left. The Spanish destroyed every single manuscript pertaining to the ancient history of the region, and the only ones still around today all have European influence. The Encomienda System the encomienda system was the first legal system of slavery enacted by European colonies in the Americas. The empire gave all Spanish adventurers and settlers the legal privilege to force labor from indigenous people. The terms and conditions were very simple. Native Americans could be exploited for free labor so long as Europeans offered military protection. The natives were also expected to convert to Christianity if they didn't want to be burned alive. The system might seem arbitrary and silly since the Spanish did whatever they wanted anyway, but in reality, the encomienda system allowed Spain to turn bloodthirsty conquistadors into colonial settlers. It was a strategy employed by the Spanish Empire to greatly extend their borders. The leaders in Spain understood that conquest only went so far. They needed a labor force and they needed farmers. They were constantly under threat by other European powers and needed to secure their claim on their new lands. And by making it legal for Spanish settlers to hold indigenous slaves, it gave an incentive for conquistadors to become landowners. Encomienda arrived in Hispaniola in 1503 as glorified slavery. It spread from the Caribbean to Mexico and then down to Central America. Then finally, it reached the conquerors in South America. The Spanish thought it was a good deal for everyone. They got free labor and the subjugated Inca had their souls saved by Christ. But the system didn't work well even for the Spanish who controlled it. The biggest issue was a drop in population. In New Spain, there were 22 million people in the year 1500. By 1550, the population was only 3 million. Internal affairs were in turmoil and the natives refused to be cooperative any longer. Even though they controlled the locals as slaves, there wasn't any work getting done. And besides that, people kept getting sick and dying. By 1542, the Spanish monarchy began trying to force conquistadors to stop being so exploitative. The encomienda system was replaced by the repartimiento system. It was still forced labor, but the workers received a very low wage. But the small wage was enough to boost productivity, and this went on well into the 18th century. The Lost City of America Archaeologists recently discovered evidence of what might have been a major battle between Native Americans in Kansas and Spanish conquistadors. Researchers found a Spanish nail from a horseshoe and an iron ball. The ball had once been fired from a European gun. The artifacts were found near Arkansas City, close to the lost city of Etsanoa. The mythical city has been a hot topic for centuries, but it looks as though it was real because archaeologists have found evidence of a settlement here. The remains of houses and farms have been discovered, 
buried underneath modern Kansas, but it's been difficult to determine how big the place was. Legend says the city had at least 20,000 people when the Spanish found it in the 17th century. Spanish conquistadors reported seeing at least 2,000 beehive-shaped houses spread out over a great plain. Juan de Onate, the governor of New Mexico, led an expedition into the Great Plains in 1601. He was looking for a lost city of gold, but came across a different metropolis. He called it Etzanoa and said it was so big it took two days to walk through. And according to him, the settlement was surrounded by fields of corn and squash as far as the eye could see. What happened between the Spanish and the people of Etzanoa is a mystery, but if the iron ball is any indication, there was a fight. Anthropologist Scott Ortman from the University of Colorado says everything he's seen has convinced him that Etzanoa was real. However, nobody can say where the 20,000 residents went after 1601. There are no further accounts from the Spanish, leaving the experts completely stumped. What do you think was the most horrendous thing the Spanish did during their invasion of the Americas? Let us know in the comments down below. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe to the channel. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.